Hello, folks. My name is Jason Spies, and I'm an award-winning multimedia journalist and then the host of the Crude Life Media Network and podcast. Thank you, folks, for tuning in to The Crude Life, a place for expert interviews, full-length features, and specialty programs. And it is all thanks to our fine sponsors. Be loyal to our sponsors. They keep the program free and literally keep our lights on. Two, one, go ahead. Dwayne Sand, uh, uh, President and CEO of North Star Water and White Horse Water, um, Captain in the Navy, father, husband, live in Bismarck, North Dakota. All right, great, outstanding. Thank you for joining the program today. Uh, what we're continuing our series on the water industry, kind of a unique topic uh, for a lot of people. Let's start off with how long you've been doing the the water industry. I've been involved since early 2012, full time. So it's uh, going on my sixth year here, very shortly. But it's been a very, very busy and rapidly changing business world uh, up there in the Bakken. How exactly does the water industry work, just in, in very, you know, elementary terms? I mean, people probably don't even realize that is an industry, or do people think it is an industry, I guess? Well, clearly everybody who knows, who reads newspapers, I would imagine, and watches TV at a minimum knows that the oil industry uses a lot of fresh water for fracking. That's how the shale plays in America. Uh, obviously, especially the Bakken are developed with fracturing of the shale and the resulting oil and gas that come up from 10,000 feet below. Over the, you know, it's been a, a huge uh, evolution of the water business, so to speak. Um, in the early days, starting in 2009 and 10, you know, usually uh, oil companies without any infrastructure, water infrastructure, would truck. And, and we know those stories. There were thousands and thousands more trucks in North Dakota just five years ago than there are now. And that was primarily how water got delivered to oil pads back when there was only one oil well per oil pad. And, you know, these days after five years of of sustained growth before the big downturn, uh, myself included, we built, you know, there's been hundreds of miles of fresh water pipe put in the ground uh, that come from all different sources, primarily uh, Lake Sakakawea and Missouri River, Little Missouri River, Yellowstone River, and some large, you know, inland lakes uh, in North Dakota. And and they go to distribution centers called CDP, Central Delivery Points, and from there they're smaller pipelines or trucks or, or long lay flat hoses, which is something that hadn't hasn't been in North Dakota in, but for three years. You know, miles and miles of this eight and ten inch and sometimes twelve inch um, largely rubber fiber mix uh, hose that lays flat when empty. Uh, which can pump up to 40 to 50 to 60 barrels per minute, uh, is set up between CDPs and oil pads. And that takes a tremendous amount of investment. So there's been an industry, a business that started up to support oil companies in fracking. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the more and more wells that are fracked lately, uh, largely since 2014, when oil wells would use about 80 to 90,000 barrels per well for fracking. Uh, typically, nowadays, there's none that are really, very few that are under 200 or 250,000 barrels. Uh, and that's because the oil industry has found out that, <clears throat> excuse me, the more fresh water they use, uh, the more oil they get. <laughs> You have an industry established. Um, you've been doing it for a while, and I wanted to ask you about uh, the water Western Area Water Supply Authority (WAS). That that got created over the last I don't know whatever it was five six years. Did that have any impact on on your business? I was talking to uh, um, a gentleman that it did, and so is 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 that the same with yours? Since you're in the same industry as uh, WAS is. 
Yeah, well, that's a great question, Jason, and that's why I'm so glad you're doing this interview and getting the word out. Uh, this story of the Western Area Water Supply is probably the biggest story of government intrusion into private business since the state of North Dakota created the Bank of North Dakota, the only state-owned bank in America, or the mill and elevator, state-owned mill and elevator, the, excuse me, the only one of that, again, that's in the country. The state of North Dakota in 2011, the legislature um, spent literally tens and tens of millions of dollars creating another political subdivision called the Western Area Water Supply Authority. And, and, and the intent was good at first. It was to bring, the stated goal was to bring water to rural North Dakotans. Uh, that's a great and noble goal. And, you know, there's a lot of farmers and ranchers, uh, even today, who still don't have uh, water, uh, a reliable source of non-well water, uh, from a central uh, location like like the Western Area Water Supply would provide them. And it's the same that's been created out in eastern North Dakota for years and years and years, and to include the Southwest Water District out of Dickinson, which has been supplying water for 20 years to farmers and ranchers all around southwestern North Dakota. The difference is the legislature in 2011 uh, decided that uh, they would give the Western Air Water Supply, it's called the laws, and now on the authority to sell industrial water at 11 different truck depots in northwestern North Dakota. And that water, which when there was a lot of trucking going on, was, uh, you know, a, a good idea to help out the industry who was running into potentially, they thought at that time, a shortage of water. Well, what happens with every government program is it happened with this program. It's grown and grown, and in 2013, particularly in 15, whereas, the, whereas WAS and their board of directors tried to literally uh, make it illegal for private citizens to sell water within 10 miles of these truck depots, they changed their tactic. When that was defeated in, in the legislature, they changed their tactic, and they... Uh, then decided that they could sell industrial water anywhere from any piece of pipe they put in the ground. And you have to understand, so the taxpayers are spending, spending millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, uh, to grow wise, which is primarily supposed to bring water to farmers and ranchers. Uh, it soon became the primary mission of wise to bring water to oil companies and bypass and ignore farmers and ranchers. And they're doing it, uh, you know, taxpayers' expense, competing with taxpayers and private industry. And on top of it, you know, they're paying uh, a fraction, a, you know, a 1%, 2% fraction of the cost of in what we spend in right-of-ways and easements across private land. So they've not only been empowered to be in, in uh, competition with us, but to do it at such a lower cost with you know, subsidized taxpayer water that it's put a tremendous strain and put several independent water providers out of business. So at one point, they actually tried to make it, make a regulation so that private water companies could not sell to oil and gas, or was it within a certain mile range of something? Or what, what, what was that? Can you clarify that a little bit? Or I'm, I'm trying to write that down. Hang on one second. Um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, in the 2011, uh, I'm sorry, in the 2013 legislature, uh, the, several bills were introduced by legislators who were supportive of laws to literally by state code make it illegal for independent water providers to provide water within 10 mile, a 10 mile radius of these truck depots. And I mean, that's clearly uh, not right. It's clearly an infraction of, of uh, rights of, that every citizen has. And it's clearly socialism. And it was defeated pretty easily, but the push kept coming, and, and, the, and then the following legislature in 2015, they changed their tactic completely and testified. I was testifying in the Senate at the same 
same committee meeting that they decided that they had decided that uh, effective in 2015, any piece of pipe they'd put in the ground, and they they put hundreds of miles in the ground, that they could and would sell industrial water to any location, build them directly to oil pads, in in direct competition with independent water providers, and do it at a fraction of the cost. So. There's many people talking about lawsuits now. We're trying to collect data on the lawsuits uh, because of laws in the private industry. But again, it's a huge story. No one's really reported on the significance of it and what it actually does in with regard to competition in the private marketplace. As I said, it's it's the biggest growth of a socialist type a political subdivision directly in competition with private industry since the creation of the Bank of North Dakota and the state-owned mill and elevator. So I wanted to ask you about WAS and the competition and the funding of it. So my understanding is, is that WAS is paid by the taxpayers. So the independent um, businesses, they pay taxes. So in theory, they are funding their competition and also that was there going to be some sort of tax that and maybe this is the uh, HB 1020 um, a bill that's introduced but I, I'm I need clarification on this but it sounds like they're going to tax the private water companies to fund WAS which is their competition which means simple terms are they trying to create a tax that is going to fund the competition of the private people? Yeah. This, so this is the other big story, Jason. Another good reason why I'm, you know, another reason why I'm so happy you're doing this, this article. More people need to know this. And, you know, especially people who vote for Republicans in in Bismarck. I'm a Republican, and the Republican Party so stands for you know, less taxes, smaller government. As we all know, there's been billions of dollars uh, spent uh, in 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 uh, the last uh, ten years, way over the budgets. So we're up. I think the official count is somewhere three hundred fifty percent of general fund budget growth since two thousand nine. And you would expect there'd be some because we've had a huge revenue increase because of oil and, and back in two thousand. Seven and nine, especially in the egg market, when uh, we had high commodity prices. Well, you know, the Republicans in power have just decided uh, not to admit they've overspent, uh, and, and and now come up with ways to, you know, feed their spending frenzy uh, by creating new taxes, and and that's in addition to every fee, pretty much in the state, from you know hunting licenses to driver's licenses have been increased. We all know that in the last four or five years. But now they've created and come up with ideas to tax, and, and, and I'm sorry, let me back up and just say, remember two years ago that they, they cut basically a percent off of the uh, extraction and gross production taxes for all companies, trying to give the dividend, spread the dividend around. And that was, <laughs> that was their solution, how feeble it was to begin with. Now they're basically putting a new tax back on the oil industry, primarily though directly to the the independent water providers to pay for the organization that the political subdivision was that was created to be in competition with them because they have overgrown, overspent. Literally, thirty percent of their budget has been spent on engineering consulting fees with AE2S out of Grand Forks. That's another huge story I hope someone looks into. But they've spent themselves into so much debt, growing their pipelines to feed the oil industry, not properly paying the right amount of attention to farmers and ranchers. And they're asking the independent businessmen and women to pay for the growth of a socialist government program, water delivery uh, subdivision that's in direct competition with them because the government program is bankrupt. So it's it's really a big story. I hope that more people will pay attention to it. And as I was saying, those people who've been voting Republican, expecting Republicans to constrain the growth of government and keep taxes low, they're the people who are doing this. 
to include now this new idea in addition to this water tax <coughs> to state owned casinos. As if I've not heard more predictions. And that came from the House Majority Leader this session. Hold on, hold on a second, you broke up there at the end. Uh, well, and I was just saying that, I mean, the, the legislature, the, the Republicans who are empowered by three to one, are coming up with new tax increases instead of, instead of paring back the size and growth of government. They're coming up with new tax increases, which is not only contra contradictory to the Republican Party platform, but it's contradictory to how we operate in North Dakota. And so, you know, whether it's a tax on water, which is what House Bill 1020 is, to pay for a government water business that's going bankrupt, it's put in competition with independents, or creating state-owned casinos. They're both bad ideas, but they're coming out of the leadership of the Republican Party and the legislature. So let me ask you about the beginning of, of the uh, Western Area Water Supply Authority, WAS, if you will, um, my, my, my understanding was is that this was a pretty controversial project out of the gate, but because the intention was there, it, it passed. D do you recall what some of the controversial aspects of this project was out of the gate? Well, I, you know, I didn't tell you, I didn't state in the opening dialogue, but I'm, I'm the co-chairman or the vice chairman of the Independent Water Provider, so which there were 100 members five years ago, and and we teared down because of consolidations and bankruptcies. Uh, but, you know, originally we testified in 2011 that the creation of the Western Area Water Supply uh, was good, but that the revenue earnings from industrial water sales, uh, which is what we provide, the independents provide, need to be constrained to just those truck depots, those 11 truck depots. Uh, but with every, as with almost every government program, you know, there's growth and growth and growth. And we call it mission creep. There's different terminology for it. Uh, so the Western Air Water Supply trying to empower themselves and make more money because they were not, uh, they were spending more money than they were taking in, uh, came up with laws right within two years to make it illegal to sell water within 10 miles of these truck depots. Two years after laws is approved, that's their, that's what they're trying to do. And then two years after that, they're deciding that um, they can sell water from anywhere in their pipelines. Uh, and as was the case last summer, and this was uh, testimony brought forth to the House, uh, they've literally told landowners who have signed up for Western Area Water Supply Services to their homes that if, you know, wives told them, if, if you don't give me an easement to bring a pipeline all over your land to sell to oil companies, we're not going to bring water to your house. Well, that's about as un-American as possible. But that is today's Western Area Water Supply, which is, you know, located in Wilson, and who I might add, uh, pays itself very nice quarterly bonuses, and those are all public information that you can find out, and um, I hope that you'll do some more reporting on that, Jason. The other thing that I uncovered is, <clears throat> and, and maybe, you know, I can ask two questions in one, which is <clears throat> the potability of the water, the potability of the water, you know, you hear the terms potable water, potable water, and then you've got, you know, reverse osmosis water. I've heard that um, a lot of what the water that is sold to oil and gas companies from WAS is like the mun municipal water, and um, they don't need that. And so that's some extra costs and et cetera. Do you know much about that uh, particular topic there? Well, absolutely. Reverse osmosis, I'm a, I'm, as you know, a nuclear engineer by trade, but there's not a lot of reverse osmosis, and, and, but there is water treatment. And all of the water that is sold to oil companies from WASE is potable water. It's drinking water. It's the same lines that feed truck depots and feed oil pads, feed the water faucets in every kitchen that it goes to, or every house it connects. 
And there is there is no stringent water requirements for you know water quality requirements for for the oil industry that's needed like that. Um, especially with these slick water fracks, which I spoke about earlier, where the average well now is twice to three times more water per well per frack. Uh, they don't need uh, the, the temperature requirements are just much less because there's less chemical added to the water, which means that impurities in the water are not as big a deal as they used to be. So, yeah, so the taxpayers are spending a large amount of water for for uh, cleaned up chlorinated waz water, which is only has one central uh, location for that treatment, which is right on the south side of Wilson by on Highway 85 as you drive in from McKenzie County into, into Williams County, where Wilson is. And um, that's another flaw in their design, by the way, which means now that instead of these small towns getting water from multiple sources, now all these towns have one source, and that's called Y. So if there's ever a major problem at that centralized treatment plant on the Missouri River south of Williston, uh, all of these towns will be affected. So that brings up an interesting question, which is, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, we had a decade, essentially, of low oil prices, you know, all but maybe one or two years. And so to have low oil prices for a, a period of time isn't unheard of. And if Waz has a large percentage of projections and finances tied to the oil and gas industry and there's a downturn, how does that impact the uh, taxpayers? Because isn't that kind of what this is all about? Is is they're in the hole and they, they need a bailout? Well, that's exactly what this is. It's a bailout. It's a tax funded, taxpayer funded bailout for a, a government entity, a political subdivision called the Western Area Water Supply, who has based all these projections and gotten money from the legislature based on these projections to grow a pipeline with uh, unsustainable, to unsustainable levels now such that the revenues are way less than, you know, the cash going out. So, so now they're asking private industry to bail out their competitor, which is the government selling government-subsidized treated water for oil fracking. It's ridiculous, and it's a... It's a huge story, and the more that the average taxpayer in North Dakota finds out about it, when they see that their property taxes are going up because the state can't keep up with that, or the school districts are raising taxes because the state can't uh, add the flow of this downturn, both in the egg market and the oil market, uh, they're going to be furious about it, and they should be, because... It, the legislature should never have created it in the first place to be in competition. They should have funded it with the appropriate amount of money to bring water to farmers and ranchers and small towns like it should have been and not to rely on industrial water sales, uh, putting itself directly in competition with those of us in the independent water providing industry. So what's next uh, for this? I mean, the, everybody knows the problem. Even the, the people in the state capitol know the problem. And their solution is to throw more money at it. Um, what's your idea of a solution for this problem? Well, the solution is very simple, actually. The, the solution is stop, uh, two things, stop growing laws, uh, except for... Uh, what's needed to bring water to farmers and ranchers. Get out of the industrial water business. It, it cannot sustain, uh, it's first wrong in the first place, but it cannot sustain itself on growth from revenue projections based on an oil uh, industry who has ebbed largely and has not recovered yet in the future. The, the other solution is, and it's sad, but it's, it's where we are now, is we're gonna have to meet the gap uh, by directly appropriating money from the legislature. You cannot just tax uh, water in the one use in one area of the state different from other uses on the private industry 
let's see, competition with the government. So the state government who created this mess is going to have to bail out wives. And, and, and when they do that, they had to fire everyone who's there, quite frankly, because they have mismanaged the growth of this and put the taxpayers at great risk, now requiring uh, tens of millions of dollars in bailout money. It should never have occurred in the first place. Any final thoughts, any comments you might want to make that uh, either we didn't touch on or things you think that uh, should be restated? I guess I, I like to give guests the final thoughts to go whatever direction they want. So um, final thoughts? Well, it's just disappointing that uh, Republican leaders are uh, who've created this mess. Their only solution is to increase taxes. Uh, and not cut spending like they, they should have. We've created, they have created this mess, uh, and it needs to be stopped. Uh, but they're not going to stop unless they hear from people. So more stories about educating the folks of North Dakota, I think, the more exerted on those legislators. Um, we, we have to understand that, you know, if you, your industry, your revenue, you know, the, I, I say to legislators all the time, who, who, who's created this wealth, this surplus? It's people, it's private businesses investing money in infrastructure and doing business uh, that creates this wealth. So to impose restrictions on generating tax revenue for the government by putting direct competition of this sort with them is it, wrong, and they just need to remember where they came from and uh, and I don't know if we're going to get there if it's going to take a long time but it needs to be done that holds us laughing and here's to the sound of one hand clapping and here's to not letting this moment pass And here's to carrying the weight of the world And here's to screaming, yeah, never being heard And here's to not letting this moment pass My name is Otis and I am the host of the Kids in Capitalism KidCast Let me tell you about one of our sponsors Catch Realty is in the business of helping people they just happen to sell real estate. Call Eric Hatch or anyone on the Hatch Realty team with any real estate question. They want to be a resource and connection for you. That's Hatch Realty, 701-212-1572. That's 701-212-1572. Hatch Realty in the business of helping people. They just happen to sell real estate. Hatch Realty, tell them what to send you. Since 1979, MBI Energy Services has committed to responsibly growing with today's oil and gas industry by providing proven experience, strategic locations, and integrated services. MBI Energy Services is well established, and its innovation in Safety and excellent customer service is what truly makes MBI Energy Services the oil field service professionals. MBI Energy Services, the cutting edge in oil field safety solutions. Learn more at mbienergyservices.com. Now, many of you are familiar with like the Soybean Bureau, the Corn Association, the Farm Council, different organizations like that. Well, let me introduce you to the Dakota Cannabis Club, a member-driven association that provides professional assistance to the cannabis industry, plus representation at the state capitol. The future of North Dakota's cannabis industry is being set today, with laws and rules under development that will define how the business can operate in the future. DakotaCannabisClub.com. That's Dakota Cannabis Club. Club.com.